worship this morning with Zion Blue Mountain United Church of Christ on our online community. Uh, we welcome you all into this space of worship through the power of technology. This is the day the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have a few special announcements this morning uh, for everyone, particularly for those folks who live on the main street of Strasstown, Pennsylvania. If you were to go outside your homes this morning, hopefully you will find a gift from our church as a reminder of the celebration of Palm Sunday. We have left little palm crosses on your porches or steps wherever we could. If we missed your house on Main Street, we apologize for that. We're being as practical and safe as we can about this, but yet wanting to share the joy of this day of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem here in our own town of Strasstown. We'd like to remind everyone else that if you're at home to prepare your palms that you've made, either maybe by cutting strips of paper or coloring pages that we provided on our Facebook page, making signs to hang in your windows, whatever it is you may do, and get yourself ready for the celebration we're about to have. We also want to remind everyone that while we're celebrating as a church, and even though we are kind of distant from each other physically, the work of this church continues and in fact even thrives at this time. We've in essence increased our ministries in many ways and so we would like to remind you to continue to give to your church, uh, to this church if you enjoy or participate in our ministries in any way through your tithes and offerings. There are several ways you can do that. You can simply mail a check to our church at PO Box 98, Strasstown, Pennsylvania 19559. Or you can call our church office and set up electronic giving. Or you can go to the Give Plus app on through either Android or the App Store for our, your iPhone users and look up our church through the zip code and set up giving that way. We appreciate your support in this time as we're not able to meet physically together. But please know that our church is continuing its ministries in many ways, not just through worship, but by being an active part of our community in our healing and recovery from the time we are in now. Please join me at this time in our responsive reading for Psalm 118. I would like to invite everyone at home to respond with the words, Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. I'll say that again, Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. I hope you all have that. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. And all who fear God say, his love endures forever. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. With the Lord on our side, what do we fear? What can we do? Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. We shall triumph over those who surround us and stand in confidence in the Lord, our God. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. The Lord is our strength and our might. The Lord has become our salvation. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Okay, so now if you've heard that, you know there's a few people here with us in our sanctuary, and they were a little bit enthusiastic, but not that much. And so we're going to invite everyone at home to really think about this for a second and remember what is going on this day. Jesus is triumphantly entering the city of Jerusalem, a city getting preparing to celebrate Passover, a city that is normally maybe 25,000 people, but now packed with a lot more being the holy site that it is. And people are really shouting. I mean, this is a parade. So where you're at at home, I'd ask you again to shout, to really shout and the three people here in our sanctuary to shout along Hosanna to God Hosanna in the highest Hosanna to God Hosanna in the highest okay, that's still kind of weak so now I'm gonna ask for a little bit of encouragement now you might want to sound out charge like you're at a Phillies game after this even though I'm a Red Sox fan but uh, we can't do that do not shout charge Jesus did not come riding into Jerusalem rapidly on a donkey with swords and charging in to tackle everyone. 
He came meekly, but yet triumphantly. So Barry's going to give us a little encouragement. And then again, let's shout again, Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. And that's a little better, and I'm getting awkward looks from the one millennial we have here. So I would ask you to do it one more time, along with Barry, after this. Go ahead. Hosanna to God. Amen. Hear from the Gospel according to Matthew how our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, Say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray together that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all those hearts gathered in worship may be found both faithful and true to you. Amen. So we hear the word Hosanna a lot today, shouting it at the beginning of worship. Hopefully you have placed it in the windows of your homes as we encourage you to do on Facebook earlier this week for this morning. If you haven't already done that, go ahead and write the word Hosanna on a piece of paper or on a poster board and put an exclamation point and put it in your window so that those going by can see it. Make yourself some palms and wave them in the air and somehow cut branches or do it out of paper and shout Hosanna or Hosanna in the highest and take pictures of yourselves and do it on your porch or your living room or your backyard. Shout it out into the street today and let us see that. Let us share that joy and excitement together today. Let us remember that we are a part of something that's been going on for a long, long time and has survived so many things. But that word Hosanna, it's a cool world. I like that word, Hosanna. This makes me feel good when I say it. It's not a word I use often. I don't go around my days around to the stores shouting Hosanna to people. I save it for the church world for a specific reason. And then there's another word, a word we've been refraining from using in church throughout Lent, the word hallelujah, which we'll be shouting next week a lot, or other people, or we often use also the word hallelujah, same thing in a way, and we'll be shouting that word on Easter Sunday, but not today because there's a difference between these words, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what that is. The word hallelujah, in essence, and I'm summing up a lot here, means praise the Lord. We're thanking God for something God has done. We're praising God. We shout out on Easter, praise the Lord, Jesus has risen. But the word Hosanna is something different. The word Hosanna has connotations of the word save or rescue or help. When we shout Hosanna, we're asking for help. We're looking out into the streets of Jerusalem and seeing Jesus coming down as if he were coming down this aisle right here and saying, Hosanna, save us, or here is our Savior, here is our help in our very real and present need. It's a difference, and today in our world, we're asking for help, and we are getting it. We are getting it, and we need to help increase that help coming into this world. As I was thinking about explaining the differences, I was thinking about an illustration. I recently watched a video online from the actor John Krasinski. You may know him from the television show, The Office. He did this in-home video, and I've been really uh, interested in the way we're now seeing stars do some things uh, from their homes and what real people they are at times. I watched Kevin Bacon and his wife, Kira Sedgwick, perform a song yesterday that was really kind of sweet and beautiful from, I guess, their living room. I've seen Samuel L. Jackson read a bedtime story that maybe only the adults should listen to, and maybe not even all of them. But they've been able to still continue their art and craft and provide a humor, a joy, or performance for us. But John Krasinski did this video, and I think, if I remember right, it's called Some Good News, SGN. And it's about a 15-minute video if you can find it on Facebook or other places. Maybe it's on YouTube where he shared good news of the day, and he ended the story with a girl named Coco. As she came down the streets of her hometown, and the streets were lined with people after her last cancer treatment. They were lined with cars of people all keeping socially distanced. This occurred very recently from each other, but still with signs and shouts of joy. And man, I just got to tell you, it broke my heart. I cried watching it cried tears of joy, sorrow that they couldn't hug her, sorrow that she had to be separate from so many of her friends who were waving to her from the street, but still cried tears of joy that they shouted these things to her to celebrate her return home and what looks like her path to good health. And so many don't have that. That's a hallelujah moment, though. That's a praise the Lord. 
I thought, well, maybe this would be a good one, and I want you to see that. I want you to see that story. I want you to look for it online and watch it. But it's not a Hosanna moment. Hosanna is a different thing. And so I want to set the stage for you a little bit about that time back in Jerusalem leading up to Passover as Jesus was coming into the city of David and how he did that. And I'd like to do that by reading some commentary from my former professor at Lancaster Theological Seminary, a true biblical scholar that's nationally recognized, Greg Carey. Greg writes, By ancient standards, Jerusalem was a significant but not massive city with a residential population of about 25,000. The Romans preferred to keep it lightly garrisoned, leaving local officials to the temple authorities, local affairs to the temple authorities. Only during the major festivals did the Romans perceive a need for additional security, especially so for a Passover, which had political undertones. Passover, after all, celebrates Israel's deliverance from captivity and occasional outbreaks of sedition attended the season. Thus, the Passover season brought crowded and somewhat tense conditions to the city of Jerusalem. The triumphal entry and temple demonstration should be understood in this context. Jesus is initiating conflict during a stressful period with revolutionary associations. The Son of David acclamations only fueled the tensions. I want to say that again. The Son of David acclamations only fueled the tensions when people shouted them. Matthew focuses the action upon Jesus as if his actions disrupted the entire city and everyone in the city could see what he was doing. Even for modern tourists, you one would realize that this could not be the case. Ancient Jerusalem, with its grand temple, was far too large and its streets too narrow for even a processional parade and a temple demonstration to gain more than street level attention. However, it is Jesus who initiates the action. Jesus, whom the crowds acclaim, and Jesus for whom the priests and elders are waiting the next day. Indeed, Jesus is not the innocent victim, at least not in the sense of being passive. Having condemned corruption in the temple, he initiates hostilities with the temple authorities. But Matthew delays that sort of conflict for later in the story, focusing for now upon the royal acclamation Jesus receives. He does not come with weapons or armies, although he does bring crowds. He is David's son, come to, pro to claim his throne. The question for Matthew's readers and hearers is, now that we have acclaimed Jesus along with the crowds and the children, will we continue in this way as conflict escalates? Wise and thoughtful and educated words from Greg Carey. So friends, as we proclaim this parade from inside our homes or on our porches or in our yards, as we shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, as we ask God to rescue us in our prayers, in our cries, in our laments, in our shouts from our porches, as we ask Jesus to save us from it all, we must ask ourselves as the church, the universal church, as the living body of Christ and the hands of feet and feet of God's will here on earth, what do we need saving from? What forces of oppression do we need to disrupt? What parts of our own choices and lives are hurting us and others? When we get through this, and we will get through this, what changes on the other side? because we will be changed. Our families, our workplaces, our social circles, our church, and our government. It can't be the same on the other side. What are the things that need us to initiate and complete change? Now, let me remind you, while this is a bold call and we all feel a certain feeling about, it, yes, we're going to be part of the change, it is not an easy one. 
The parade of provocation of Palm Sunday is soon followed up by betrayal, denial, and death by crucifixion. So whatever you choose to be a part of changing, make it worth it. Martin Luther said, if we must sin, sin boldly, something like that. I'm saying if we are going to change ourselves and others, if we are going to push some buttons in this world, let's make it worth it. Because the cross will come. But when we are with God, the cross provokes the resurrection. I'd like you to hear those words again. Because the cross will come. But when we are with God, the cross provokes the resurrection. Father Richard Rohr, a wonderful theologian who I read often, wrote recently, Resurrection will always take care of itself whenever death is trusted. Very powerful words. And yes, let me read them again to you. Resurrection will always take care of itself whenever death is trusted. Friends, it is time for changes. It won't be easy. Some things will die. But God is always doing a new thing. And so today in our shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, let us be more fixed upon God's rescue than we are the crosses we are clinging to. Amen. Please join me in today's prayer of confession. Let us pray. O Lord, who on this day entered the rebellious city that later rejected you, we confess that our wills are as rebellious as Jerusalem's, that our faith is often more show than substance, that our hearts are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us, Son of David, Savior of our lives. Help us to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are, trusting you to forgive what is sinful, to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. Amen. Friends, so often my assurance of pardon that I give during worship is filled with many more words, but today I want you to focus on simply knowing the assurance that you are forgiven. Amen. Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem and to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stir up within us the gift of faith that we may not only praise him with our lips, but we may follow him in the way of the cross. Amen.